correct that practice that we had for a time of praising the Lord every day, every Sunday for sure. So Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. And then it goes on to talk about praising God with musical instruments like we just did. And then it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I think it's a command. I think it's an encouragement. And I think God does it for a lot of reasons. When I get up here and talk about what's going on in my life, that tells you a little bit about me. And when you come up and tell, it tells me a little bit about you. And I think that it also shows where our love is. Is our love, it shows where our love is. Our love is with God and with all that he's doing in our lives. So that's why I'm encouraging us to start again. Because I think it's going to help us with our, our little new beginnings that we've got going on. Um, let's see. So when you want to schedule time, see me. And that kind of praise connects us. I really believe that. It testifies to the fact that God is working. Sometimes when you're discouraged, when you're in the middle of a battle, a trial, some pain, it's hard to see that God's actually working. And when I get up, I remind you. And when you get up, you remind me. So that's what I'm here for, first of all. I wanted to uh, encourage each one of you to encourage each other. So some things about uh, getting up in front. Uh, I want to encourage you to have your kids do it. If they want to come and praise God, they can. There's nothing that's stopping that. Um, Rob asked us to keep it to five to seven minutes. That's a challenge sometimes. But I encourage you to write it out if you need to. If you want to practice with me, I'm willing to listen. Uh, if you don't even need practice, that's okay too. So just come on up and, and tell us what God's doing in your life and why you're praising him. Um, also bring a scripture if you can. That just encourages, kind of puts things together. And try to keep it to one topic. So... For mine, um, someone want to time, will you time me, Rob? Five minutes, okay? I brought a timer, I thought I was, I brought Rob my timer. Um, so the second reason I wanted to be up is I wanted to tell you about my banner year. I've had a banner year. And I, I wouldn't have really realized that, I don't think, if the Lord hadn't laid it on my heart to give a testimony. So I've had a banner year, and here's why. A lot of things have happened, of course, but these are some of the highlights. God has blessed me abundantly, and that's my praise. How good he is to bless. He's amazing in the way he cares for his children. Um, so every time I say, praise the Lord, I want you guys to praise the Lord with me, okay? Yeah, June 14th of this year, 2016, I should say last year, Wayne and I celebrated 30 years of marriage. That's huge. Praise the Lord, right? Uh, June 2016, uh, Esther graduated from high school, and I know that's all on her, but it's on me a little bit because I helped her, so um, praise the Lord, absolutely. Um, November 2016, God enabled me, and some of you that know me a little bit better know that this is a huge thing for me. I worked for a full year outside of the home, a full year, so praise the Lord, right, Cherry? Praise the Lord, because that's not, that wasn't an easy thing. And for those of you that have been working 30, 40 years, praise the Lord. <laughs> I know I'm a whim. Um, so that's one thing. I just have a couple more. How am I doing for time? Oh, good. Okay, as long as I get within the five minutes, I'll be happy. Okay, <laughs> crack the whip. Um, I, in November, that same job, totally out of the blue. I had no idea it was coming. I received an award, a $1,000 award for consistent hard work over a six-month period. I was like, what? No way. I just couldn't believe that I got this award. I didn't, I didn't even know it was, I was in the running. So praise the Lord, right? And I, why I love that and why I love working outside the home is because, of course, I can help with the budget, but I, we can give more. And I love that. We can give more money to, to the church and to other people. So... That's why I really love the award that God gave. A um, couple more things. 2016, I saw my fourth and my fifth baby being delivered. So I'm just, Leah delivered uh, Keevan, my grandson, on December 13th. And it was such a privilege and a joy to see both of my grandsons delivered safely. So that was a gift of love and life from our father. I was so proud of Leah. 
she was really brave, and I was really, really proud of her. And Esther, too, she watched. <laughs> so praise the Lord for a new life, for sure. Um, and then my last one was that, and this is no measure least, um, in November I took my test to become a Canadian citizen. I know, so I know I'm going to be a U.S. citizen and a Canadian citizen, and on Tuesday is when I actually do the swearing-in ceremony, and so I want to invite you all to come over to our house Tuesday night from 7 to 9 and have a piece of cake and give me your advice on how to be the best Canadian I can be. <laughs> <laughs> I need some advice. So that's this coming Tuesday. That's when my swearing-in ceremony is. We're going to have it that night. So I know you'll be busy and all, but just pray for us. So I'm almost done. How close am I? About five minutes. In these, uh, all these blessings, God's loved me and equipped me. He's shown me how to work in tandem with him. He's the one, but we're partnering together, and I'm thankful for that. And I want to praise the Lord. That all. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. We're starting a series today that will continue right up uh, through into the second week of February. As I connect with people, it becomes fairly evident that for each of us, there's stuff in our past that acts forward on us into the present and hinders us from experiencing a full life. Uh, and, and sometimes it's hard for us to see these sorts of things um, because we just go through our normal life. but, but but if we can take a moment and step back, or, or, or sometimes when we encounter situations that create tension in us, we know, where's that tension coming from? Why is that creating tension for me? If any of you struggle with anger, you've got to understand there's something from your past that's still unresolved. Uh, there, there's still something you're fighting. Uh, if you're struggling with anxiety, well, where's that anxiety coming from? What, what in your past uh, ca caused you to become anxious and worrisome about life? And, and if some of you are struggling with low self-worth, well, where did that come from? There was something in your past, a message that was sent to you, spoken into your life in the past, that's still acting on you in today. And the question, how is that even possible? How is it possible that something that maybe happened even 30 years ago, and it's done, and it's completed, and you're separated from it, but still today, it's influencing you with fears, or insecurities, or anger, or, or whatever it is, there's stuff from the past, and, and you remember it at times. Times when you, um, when you remember a, just a painful word someone spoke to you. Or sometime when you let someone down and they let you know it, and you felt terrible for it. Or, or sometime when you just messed up in some way. And, and, and there are times in the quiet moments that, that suddenly these, these thoughts, of these memories start going through our minds, and they just want to beat us up. And we want to beat ourselves up. And we feel terrible for all those things. And I, I, I mean, how does that happen? It, it, it traps us with, with regrets. I, I, I mean, do any of you struggle with regrets? And I don't just mean simply, okay, you look back and say, yeah, I wish I hadn't done that. But the regret actually works forward and it robs you of joy in the present. Are, are you struggling with, with some shame and, and things that you still want to keep hidden from the past? Um, are, are there messages, messages in your head that say, I, I'm not that lovable? Um, I, I'm not that significant. Well, th that stuff that's coming at us from the past. And, and you know, I, I remember times when I've messed up in the past. And, and those, those, those failings, uh, specifically times when I let people down. Or when I hurt some, or when a group of people got angry with me because of, of something that I did. And, 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 and those memories can, can just work forward in, in our minds. And I remember once... <clears throat> that uh, is we were going through a parenting seminar. And at that point in time, my, my son Brett, I don't know, he was probably maybe six or seven years old. And I noticed that Brett started to be more cautious about trying new things. He was very hesitant about um, of, of just venturing out and, and stuff. And there was some sort of fear at work there. And, and, and we went through this parenting seminar and uh, one of the comments in the parenting center was saying, if you have a child that doesn't like trying new things or that they hold back, it's probably because there's a critical parent. 
a parent that, as they look at them, keeps pointing out what they're not doing right. And so the child, out of fear of not doing something right, just doesn't try anything at all. And I looked and said, I realized, you know what? I do that. Uh, it, not that I wasn't condemning, but it was always coming along saying, hey, that's great. You know, if you just did this a little bit over here, it'd be even better. Because I got that critical eye and saying, and saying okay, hey, that was great. Now, if you just did this, that could be even done better. And, and, but what the message I was communicating is you never do it well enough. Right? You, 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 you never do it good enough. It could always be done a little bit better. And, and, and you're saying, hey, that was great for the most part. Well, what are they hearing? And, and so it was sort of a, a message to me to, to realize that, that, you know, these words that I was speaking, that, and they weren't meant to be condemning words. They, they're meant to be encouraging words, right? And, and, and helping them grow even more. But, but the words uh, were starting to have an impact on him that even they were in his past, but it's kept him from wanting to try new things in his present at that point in time. And so I was speaking words that was trapping him in sort of a low self-worth and that the condemnation, which maybe even t today, like, there, there's a remnant of that there, but, but it was enough for me to kick in to realize I need to start changing that and to work hard at, at not doing that. And, and as, as I stopped doing that, I realized, okay, I start to see there was a bit of healing in him, and he started becoming more adventurous and started trying things again and risking and stuff. But that, that took some time. But it just embedded in my mind again and again how we can build into people's lives in such a way that it traps them in the past as well. But each of us struggles with this in some way. And, and I, I think of some of the condemning statements. I, I bet you each of you can think through a time when you remember someone said something that was a little bit condemning to you. And it still bothers you today. When you think of that person, it probably creates a tension in you. And maybe you're not even completely free to love that person because you're still holding something against that person for something that happened way back then. Words of condemnation come at us. And, and sometimes people even will speak words and they're not meaning them to be condemning, but we interpret it that way. Um, I mean, I've encountered that type of scenario when I've said something to someone, I meant it as encouragement, but they heard it in a different way. And I, man, like, how, how did you even hear that? I didn't, I didn't mean it that way at all. And we've all had that type of experience, right, where we've said something to someone and it got taken a completely different way because there's certain filters and grids we have up. And, and when these words of condemnation come to us, whether intended or not, we do one of three things with them. Either one, we accept them and saying, you're right. I did mess up, and um, I am a failure. Um, man, <laughs> um, I blew it. And, and what do I do with that? I, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm not that worthwhile. I'm not that significant. There is something wrong with me. I, I messed up. And, and we just replay that tape over and over and over again. Secondly, if we don't accept it, we, we fight it. Saying, oh yeah, you're going to come. Oh, we, we see that in the politics, right? Someone says something condemning and what this, this it, they fight it, right? It's, it's uh, we, the idea that when, when someone speaks into your life a word of what you perceive as condemnation, sometimes we say, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to fight back at it. Well, what we're actually doing is we're accepting it. Even though we're fighting it, the only reason we're fighting it is because we, somehow we're giving it some strength and value and significance in our life. Someone says you're an idiot. Oh, yeah, well, you're an idiot. <laughs> well, why would you need to defend against their statement unless what they're saying actually got through to you and wounded you in some way? That maybe there's that unacceptance, that failure. That there's some sort of message of failure and condemnation that, that struck and got through to you and evoked a reaction to fight against what they're saying. Did you ever have someone tell you you couldn't do something, especially as a kid? What did that make you want to do? I don't know, do you ever remember me telling you that um, I, I, I went to, in junior high, Dave Tonin would have been there. We went into the science lab and they had the big, uh, they had the big inflatable planetarium. Do you remember that? Yeah. It was all dark and cool. It had this tunnel you had to crawl into and, and, and you go in, they'd shine the stars up. I thought, this is so cool. I'm going to build one of these. I went home and told my mother, I'm going to build one of these. She says, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> Guess what? 